Okay, so um, when I when I saw the, the, the topic of the lecture, um, artist in the lab, um, I thought that could as well be uh, called the engineer in the art studio because the the it's totally reversible. In in our case, it's really a, a hybrid of both. Um, we work in a I work in a lab. I had had a, a lab that I founded which is called the Enixi Gestasio Design Lab. I will not explain the name uh, here. Uh, but it's based on, on this sentence, Any, anything can grow in a field of numbers. Um, it's a, a studio lab of research creation that design, produce, and diffuse works, installations, and art performance that are all oriented towards the exploration, uh, uh, to exploring the impact, the risk, and the potential of applying digital technologies in all fields Link it to art and design. Uh, the, the, the work we are doing are intrinsically transdisciplinary. This is very hard to pronounce. And, um, and they are at the crossroad between digital art and science art. And so we uh, regularly, from, from the beginning of the, the, our, our work, we uh, uh, very often collaborate with engineers and scientists from all disciplines and from labs. Uh, in different countries uh, uh, across the world, and our work are uh, diffused in art events as well as in science technology events and magazines and reviews. You may recognize the Aerostabil uh, that uh, uh, David has uh, spoke about. That project was born in my lab. Um, the thing is, we, we are interested in robotics um, not as much as what it can do, but as what it is. And uh, it comes from a very long field of device and mechanism that come back to the oldest antiquity. And what fascinates me with the, the uh, automata is not um, their function, but their status. And the basic reason for doing an automata is that it simulates life. So we decided, I decided a long time back to create an automata that is still and useless. It doesn't move and doesn't do anything. And its only role in the world, in this universe, is to simulate a kind of human uh, living being with a shape that is not biological or nothing. But when I begin to discuss with engineers and scientists about this project, they all came with a wealth of potential functions and practicalities. And it was not that easy to uh, remove all these functions and practicalities to remain to the core of the project, but nonetheless, um, some of them have been, uh, have been developed along the years, including the one that, you, that David presented. And um, also the fact that um, uh, they can be used as a platform for uh, not only um, um, art performances, but also for science and technology. And when we decided to show one in a very large cave in southern France, and just for the aesthetic aspect of this object in the, in the primordial geological layers, uh, every speleologist was fascinated and said, okay, why don't you put lights and, project and uh, cameras so you can explore the cave with that. So we had to um, prepare the cube to explore the cave. And obviously it was not made for that, but I'm showing this work just because it led to another project which directly descends from it, which is this one, which is called Scutigera. And this project is a, a robot that is specifically, specifically designed to explore places where no one can go, like, um, like uh, tunnels uh, that are unreachable. And it, it is loaded with different devices that allow it to um, explore and not get stuck somewhere. And this project is uh, now going on. We are now building the first elements of this robot. We are also um, working on, on uh, uh, different kinds of robots. Uh, this one is called Ono. Oh it's a very, very slow vehicle. The slowest vehicle you can imagine is maximum speed is uh, 100 millimeters a year. Um, in, it's a premiere. I've never seen anything as slow as that, except some kind of astronomical clocks. They are only uh, devices that are this slow. Why do we create such a vehicle? Well, it's basically a tench best, um, um, bench test, sorry, <laughs> bench test for this uh, art installation, which is called the Wegener Heart. 
in which is um, meant to translate into a visible and perceptible phenomenon the movement, relative movement, of two tectonic plates. So, you see in these two works, um, the, the aim is to reveal something that exists and that cannot be uh, reached otherwise, and to create these uh, devices to bring them to human perception, which is uh, um, precisely what is meant with uh, what we mean and what we try to do with the Mont Cathedral project. The Mont Cathedral project is going on now. We have been working extensively in it for about two years, but the first roots were planted about 10 years back. And in this project, I will try to show how the art project can be rooted in several fields of knowledge, and the merging of these fields of knowledge create an artwork that is very simple to experience, but um, that you can uh, explore onto many layers and to see how, um, by exploring these layers, you can modify your perception of the work. So, the basic question uh, at the basis of this installation is, where am I? Where am I is the basic question of all architecture. Um, any field has a basic questions, like physics is uh, something moves, for instance, why? And philosophy is uh, um, something is, and especially I am. And uh, exploring this question lead to uh, the development of the field. So architecture is where am I? And uh, the main orientation system that you can uh, imagine in the world is based on locations and places. I will not elaborate on that either. But I would just say that in the past, one of the main ways to know where you are is to um, explore where is the center of the world. Mont Cathedral is at the intersection of history, music, architecture, technology, mathematics, and physics. And um, all these fields connect and join into this very strange concept called harmony. Harmony is a very old concept, as you may know, and uh, is as old at least at the Greek antiquity, which is why I show a picture of the Olympus mountain in Greece. And Olympus and harmony basically have the same etymology. Um, it is from there that something rules and organizes the world. In the Antiquity, the um, harmony of the universe was based on proportions of, human, of integral numbers themselves based on the proportions of the human body. It was an ideal human body. If you look at this statue, which is called uh, uh, the sculpture, the Doryphorus, he has proportion based on integral numbers, but it makes a um, human being that cannot exist. It's a little bit like a Barbie today. That's, uh, that are ideal proportions that you can try to reach, but you will never reach them. Nonetheless, they were considered as the proportions of the gods, and the proportion of the gods were transmitted to the proportion of architecture and musical scale, which were seen as cosmological echoes on both sides. The, uh, these proportions were um, ruling about everything in the world. Here is a cosmology of the past where you can see music, solar system, the elements, uh, earth, water, air, fire. And they were ruling also the, the steps of a woman's pregnancies and the economy. It was an overwhelming concept, which remains on different um, avatars up to uh, the Renaissance. And meanwhile, all the solar systems that were imagined in the past, that were all based on this musical analogy, um, were progressively transformed while maintaining this harmonic connection, while the center of the world was moving. It was from the surface of the Earth, then center of the Earth, then it went out of the Earth, and the story of the universe basically is the story of the movement of the center of the world and today, the only thing that we can tell, say about the center of the world is that it is basically nowhere. So, because of the princi relativity principle, we can define about any point in the world as our center of the world. Which means that I can perfectly decide 
that the center of the world is where, I'm, where I am. I will just show, show you a few pictures to um, illustrate the fact that the cosmological models translate directly in architecture. Here, is, here are all Greek temples uh, where nobody could enter except for the priests. They were completely centrifugal architectures. This was the center of the place, and it was the, the most sacred place on Earth. So in, in this cosmological model, that was the center of the world. While the uh, architecture of sacred buildings evolved, it went into many steps. And in these steps, you can see that it's not anymore a central building. These are Gothic cathedrals, uh, but a procession. People would enter here to reach the most sacred place on earth, which was somewhere here. It was a small box where the Christ should reside in the church. But while it was uh, going this way, also the center of the world could have an access to the world of human. Um, there are many um, arguments for that. But uh, one of the main things that is very important is that human being could become celestial being by becoming saints. So these architectural devices are passerelles between the world of God and the world of human. Later on, the center of the world, and uh, I just skipped one, and this is on the Renaissance, and you see that even at this period, the architecture of the church were based on the architecture of human bodies, human proportions. But then the church became centred. Why? It's because the centre of the world, quote-unquote, and centre of architecture came at the centre of the building. That was a concentric building. Exactly like in the Greek temple, except that it was reversed. Now the, in the exterior is here, and you access the most sacred place by here. So we went from a building that is centrifugal, to a processional building, to a building that is the anti-symmetrical from the Greek temple, and so on. And it went on to into, uh, also into the architecture of, uh, of uh, domestic houses. This is the first house in Occident, Occidental world with a cupola on the, on the top. This is the Villa Rotonda that was reserved to sacred buildings. And you can see that also the building is completely concentric, which means that human being become extremely important and as important as the gods in the model of the world. Then came contemporary science. And contemporary science, uh, with Kepler, for instance, decided or discovered that the planets and the main orbits of celestial bodies were elliptical. And this is Saint-Pierre de Rome in Rome, where you can see that the plaza is an ellipse with the sun and fountains at the Foki. And this has been described as the first cosmological model architecture based on Keplerian cosmology. Baroque church used also the ellipses that did not exist before. And then the universe became infinite. And then the building became spherical because they just decided that, well, we live in an infinite universe and these are the replica of the universe uh, just before the French Revolution. Meanwhile, a French engineer, um, Joseph Louis Nicolas, Nicolas Durand, decided that any building is not an individual object in space, but just the delimitation of an infinite space that spread in all directions. And by putting limits here, you design the building. But there is no reason to stop the space here. The space spreads all over the universe. So the universe is infinite, and buildings are just parts of this small and infinite universe. So where I am, I am just at the center of something, and that something is my own spheres. When I say that the center is, of the universe is where I am, it may look pretentious, but I just say it's the same for every human being. So there is no privileged place. So you have two kinds of different spheres uh, from where you are centered. First, the one where you project the elements of reality which is called the perceptual sphere, and this one which is called the sphere of eventual interaction, which is from a, a theory by a, a French philosopher Bergson, and you design, you define the radius of these spheres by your potential to act of, on what you see. It can be a, either physical acting or symbolical acting while you try to relate with someone. So around you, 
you live in a center of different spheres of different radius that move and travel with you. And if you are not convinced about that, you just look over you and you see that center of the sky is always over you. The zenith travels with you. It's right over your center of eventual interactions. Then, after the birth of contemporary science, uh, the notion of harmony, and particularly the harmony of the spheres, lost any pretension to say anything sensible about the universe. And it was replaced, basically, by this notion of harmonics that came into physics. Harmonics, you may know this drawing, show that when you have a complex signal, you may construct it by adding simple signals that are called harmonics. Any musician is perfectly aware of that. But what is less known is that uh, this theory, which is uh, due to Fourier, um, applies to about everything. Not only sound, but it applies to light, it applies to drawings and patterns, and also to 3D environments. We can reconstruct all these environments around us through um, harmonics, but they are not simple harmonics like that. They are spherical harmonics that we will see. But meanwhile, it means that you can construct a complex sound by adding simple frequencies, and that you can analyze a complex sound through this first um, sonograph, spectrogram sonore, to detect the harmonics that are in it, that construct it. Here are some uh, spherical harmonics. Um, they can be represented in many different ways. Uh, the important thing is that Instead of using trigonometric functions like sound harmonics, they use these functions here that are called the Legendre polynomials that you see here on 2D. And around the sphere, they create these patterns in certain forms of representation. This is the first one. This is the second one, third one. And for each one, you have second order harmonics on each side. What is fascinating is that despite the fact that the harmony of the sphere does not describe the world anymore, you can describe a lot of things with harmonics, and in particular with spherical harmonics. This is a French physicist, Louis de Broglie, who understood why the electronic orbitals were at certain distances from the radius through a musical analogy. He compared the orbit of the electrons to the vibration of a string. And through a direct musical analogy, he understood that the orbitals, electronic orbitals were made in certain way, which is fantastic because they were so small that nobody could observe them. And then at the other end of the scale, uh, this is a French physicist, Jean-Pierre Luminet, who by analyzing the fossil radiation at the other end, this is the whole universe here, the whole, whole celestial sphere with the very old fossil radiation, he noticed that some harmonics were missing in this part of the spectrum, and that means that the universe must be much smaller than we imagine. Much, much smaller. And if we see it this big, it is because it reflects itself into this kind of reflections, which is called a Poincaré reflections or dodecahedron reflection. This has not been demonstrated, has been published in the major science review in the world, meaning that if we are here in the, in the Earth, we can, by observing far enough, see how the Earth was billion of light, a uh, billion of years before. So what does that show? It shows basically that harmony and harmonics play a little bit the same role in the past and today. They are messengers from unreachable worlds, the worlds of God in the past and the macrocosm and the microcosm today. They are organizers because they put the world in order, you harmonize the world, and you can also describe the complexity of the world through harmonics. This is, the basis of the, this is the basis of the Mount Cathedral project, in which we begin by cutting a building in spherical shells. And these shells are the spheres of eventual interaction of, or of perception. And they are centered to where you are. Then you take one of these shells, you isolate it, and you see that there is a pattern on this shell. And this pattern, you can describe it through spherical harmonics. And you can create its spectrum. Here are 81 spheres extracted from the rotunda, Villa Rotonda. 
And we did exactly the same with the Mount Cathedral, which began by creating a 3D model of the cathedral, so in itself a, a very important work. This is part of the model being constructed by Guillaume Credo, an architect working in Lebanon, and he's a, a, a real genius of 3D modeling. And then we, dis we decompose the cathedral in spheres of equal radius and progressively increasing radius. So you can see the blue sphere are the smallest one, the yellow are the biggest one, and on the largest sphere you have only a small tiny piece of the cathedral appearing. And here's another drawing showing the very thin spheres. We select among all, all these spheres about 20 of them, separated by one meter interval, and when you travel the cathedral, these spheres travel with you, and they cross the walls and the stone of the cathedral, changing constantly the patterns on their surface. So here you see spheres that are progressively inflating inside the cathedrals, and you see the patterns that appear on the different spheres, and you see that obviously when the sphere inflates, the patterns change. And then you take one and you analyze it, and you go and get all the spectrum of its different harmonics. There are quite a few of them. To describe the whole cathedral from all the possible points for the visitors, we reach a total of 3.4 billion harmonics total. And then we convert these spherical harmonics into sound harmonics through an algorithm that we develop, a coding, decoding process that we develop. So for each spherical harmonic, we have a particular sound. And then we define within the cathedrals a large number of points, 60,000 points separated by 30 centimeters interval. And these points are all associated with a musical sound that corresponds to the musical transposition of the cathedral at this very point. So you can see that all these points, they go up to a little bit that two meters high from the ground. They are like small musical drops that stand still in space, and when you cross them, you hear them. Well, how do you hear them? Well, here comes the part where we install the dispositive, the, the device that goes um, toward the, the, the topic of this lecture. First, um, we divide uh, the cathedrals. I divided the cathedral in 35 sections so as to have different combinations of harmonics to create different sounds. And then we constructed this small device, which is called a harmonic lantern, which is packed with technologies and uh, memory and um, has been constructed in Polytechnic School uh, in Montreal and made with 3D prototyping. And you travel in the cathedrals while holding this small system, a little bit like a candle. And whenever the harmonic lantern crosses a sound, crosses a point where there is a sound, you hear the sound. So by walking or by sitting and moving the lantern in the air, you create your own harmonic symphonies or architectural symphonies. We catch the trajectories of the people. This one was a rather simple one. Uh, there are some strange jumps because our, our sensors were shadowed at some point by the columns. But this is uh, basically um, the partition of one, special partition of one of these symphonies. And since I'm pretty sure you're curious to hear what it sounds like, um, this is the spectrogram of one of them. correspond to the wandering of a visitor within the cathedral. And you can see into the spectrum that the, these are the lower frequencies, these are the highest frequencies, these are the ultra high frequencies, and the people travel while hearing these different sounds. This is about a four minute walk in the cathedral. So basically what we created is a, a augmented reality system, but the reality is augmented for something that we also invented. And in this invent, in this thing that we invented, we packed a lot of uh, history and architecture and physics layer. But obviously, when you travel in the, in the cathedral with the lantern, you do not need to know all these things. They are not relevant to your own appreciation of the system. But we extended 
you sense through a kind of prosthesis that you have in your hand, and your prosthesis is absolutely necessary to detect this musical universe that we created. And I will just end up by showing that through this work, we, uh, it opened on many different um, uh, exploration uh, paths. Like, for instance, we created all these small sculptures that are uh, bronze, are metal sculptures and polymer sculptures, uh, expressing the spherical transposition of the cathedral. Then um, inventing new shapes, like reversing the reconstitution of a church. This is a spherical inversion of this church. Or moving it in time, like this, which helped us to create the design of the Ono very slow vehicle. So uh, through these uh, few uh, pictures, I hope I've shown you that there, there are ways to create that are completely uh, inspired and um, feed, fed by scientific or technological knowledge and that you can create effectively an artwork where you can either just appreciate or explore the different layers. And this exploration will modify your understanding of the work and your appreciation of it.